Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stradwatts in Sydney where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens and the top stories this hour. Asia getting a positive lead in as US stocks extend their bull run. A record sale of 10-year treasuries at a discounted yield adding to confidence of a Fed pivot. Disney's full-year profit beats as it reveals a big gaming investment. Arm Holdings giving a surprisingly bullish forecast ahead of SoftBank earnings. Plus, China replaces its securities regulator in a surprise move that may signal tougher action to end the market route. Let's take a look at how we're shaping up this Thursday morning as we get Australia coming online in that staggered open. We're seeing upside of about uh, just about a tenth of 1% after the S&P 500 closes just on the brick of that historic 5,000 mark. And we had that biggest ever 10-year auction of treasuries uh, really leading the way for how we see some of sovereigns, uh, some of these sovereigns perform here in the Asian session as well. Watching Australia 3 and 10 yields at this point. We're seeing uh, a little bit upside when it comes to trading in Aussie stocks at the moment. Firmly in Focus will be uh, the earnings season to sort of gathering pace this month. Consumer spending, the economic recovery and stimulus efforts out of China, potentially higher dividend payouts will be some of the themes that we are uh, watching for when it comes to reporting from Australia's largest companies uh, amid, of course, these RBA expectations to ease policy this year as well. The Aussie dollar at this point pretty muted, 65.20. We had the dollar kind of uh, pretty anchored within that narrow trading range in the overnight session, uh, so not much of a move when it comes to uh, some of these Asian currencies so far. Switching on the board to take a look at some of the other markets that we are watching. Uh, Kiwi stocks down by about two tenths of a percent. We're seeing Chicago Nikkei futures looking broadly positive and dollar yen holding pretty steady at that 148 uh, level that we're watching at the moment. Uh, up about two tenths of a percent amid those gains across US shares. We're watching for that uh, BOJ Japan, uh, the BOJ I should say Deputy Governor speech on Thursday for any hint. Uh, Bell of course to the end of negative rates. Yeah, all about that policy normalisation. But here in After Hours, we're tracking some of the big names that reported after the bell today. And just take a look. I mean, I think you can see here, Arm is really standing out. So this is the chip designer uh, listed just last year. And it came out with a very strong forecast. It's about the forecast for all of these numbers here. But Arm is saying for the current quarter, they can make as much as $900 million in revenue. You compare that to the average analyst estimate of around 780. So that is a big gap there. And that's why we're seen that jump in after hours. Disney as well, again, a stronger forecast coming through. They're also going to be investing about $1.5 billion into Fortnite maker Epic Games. PayPal under pressure. Again, it's the guidance that's coming through here, but to the weaker side because they're actually seeing flat earnings. So these are some of the big movers in after hours, but let's change on, take a look at what's happening in the start of trade for futures here. Again, you're fairly steady at this point in time. They've just come online. But put it in context of the moves we had intraday during the session because U.S. stocks continued to power ahead. We saw the S&P 500 closing within striking distance of that 5,000 mark. You're slightly above that there in the futures. But uh, certainly something to be tracking. Again, it's that uh, how investors are really interpreting the, the, the Fed commentary as well, seeming to shrug off this, uh, this question of when we're going to see any sort of cuts. And that also came through from the Boston Fed president. Take a listen. Expecting all indicators to be well aligned is too high a bar. But seeing sustained, broadening signs of progress should provide the necessary confidence that I would need to begin a methodical adjustment to our policy stance. So again, just another Fed official there pushing back on these market expectations of imminent rate cuts. But where we are seeing that need for further easing, of course, is in China. And uh, we have had some more changes as well in terms of the leadership there. We had the top of its securities regulator has been changed. It's the latest step to hold a stock market slide that's wiped $5 trillion worth of market value from onshore indices since a peak back in 2021. So let's bring in uh, our Chief North Asia correspondent it's Stephen Engel here. So, Steve, what's the latest here? Pretty surprise move yesterday. Yeah, that's right. But also, if you think about the steps that the securities regulator, as well as Beijing authorities as a whole, been trying to do to stop the stock market uh, slide, 
have been piecemeal at best. And yes, we get a little bit of rally, then it falls back because the overall sentiment has been pretty weak. You have sliding stocks, you have a sliding economy, you have an ongoing property slump, you have geopolitical tensions with the United States, and you're coming up onto a hard break, if you will, using television terms, and that is a week-long holiday mm -hmm. where sentiment is pretty weak right now. So something had to be done. And it's been a pretty bad year for top officials in Xi Jinping's uh, you know, government. You, you lost the foreign minister, Ting Gang, he was replaced. You have the top uh, you know, general in the PLA replaced, mm -hmm. uh, Li Xiangfu. Uh, now you have the securities regulator abruptly changed. Uh, given the situation and given the precedence in the past when uh, the securities regulator has changed, you usually get a boost in stocks because, again, they're given a mandate to use perhaps more forceful approaches to stop uh, a potential stock market slide or whatever rectification that needed to be done. So here's the two gentlemen in question right now. Yi Hui Man, who was uh, the securities uh, regulator, the chairman and party boss of the CSRC uh, since 2019. He is on his way out and Wu Qing is coming in. He's uh, considered to be a hardliner. Uh, he takes a more hardline approach to discipline, uh, which probably is in line with what Xi Jinping would want right now. Zero tolerance is kind of his slogan and he is known as the broker butcher. Uh, that's a nickname that he earned, uh, what, in the mid 2000s when he really led a crackdown on uh, malfeasance, if you will, and bad practices within the brokerage industry in China. He shut down 31 different brokerages in China in the mid 2000s. So he is going to uh, basically enforce discipline because uh, the CSRC in the last few days, as late as Monday, came out and said we have evidence of malicious short selling, stock market manipulation. So if there is malfeasance happening, this guy's going to root it out, and they're going to have a week-long holiday to kind of come up with a strategy. Yeah, Steve, as we head into the, the year of the dragon, right, you know, it's supposed to be the most auspicious of the horoscope, powerful, you know, wealth, success, not exactly the themes that we're associating with the Chinese economy at the moment, and uh, we're going to get more data today. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the uh, deflation persists, and that's a uh, you know, real difficult situation for an economy that is trying to get out of this slump on multiple fronts, as I just mentioned. We're going to get CPI deflation numbers expecting a fourth consecutive month in January of consumer price deflation. We know mm -hmm. at the factory gate, producer prices have been weak for 15 consecutive months. That's also expected to continue. So, yeah, heading into the week-long holiday when people travel, uh, whether they're going to be spending, because the Ministry of Commerce has already declared that 2024 is going to be the year of promoting consumption. It's, it, it's an inauspicious start to the Year of the Dragon, for sure. Our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle there with us with the latest on China and of course one of China's biggest companies. Alibaba's U.S. traded shares fell the most since November after the company reported lower than expected sales overshadowing its move to extend a buyback program. Let's get some more on this with Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Catherine Lim. And uh, Catherine, uh, you know, the, the, the stock has been trading on some optimism, but what was ultimately the biggest disappointment out of these numbers? Right. I think, you know, what brought the stock back to square one, you know, the last um, over the last week, really, was that, you know, there seems to be more uncertainties facing the stock as firstly, the company now is pushing for global e-commerce comeback in China as well as overseas. So they are going to be spending more in 2024 possibly actually giving up, you know, the profit gains that they've actually made, um, you know, in the last one year. And um, that's one. Secondly, they've also highlighted that there are uncertainties in market conditions that may actually hamper divestment plans, including the IPO of Tainiao. So these were the two key things that actually um, stood out that overshadow, I would say, um, you know, the enlarged share buyback program by the company. And we know Alibaba really needs to, to catch up ground that it's lost to, to peers like PDD. Are we seeing any sort of signals of an e-commerce comeback at all? Well, do you know what? We are in the very early stage. What is interesting is that, you know, they've identified Europe and developed Asia as markets that, um, you know, their key business, AliExpress, will be focusing on um, in the near term. So, you know, that may actually slow down some of the 
uh, expansion by PTD outside of US. We'll have to see what actually comes true um, over the next 10 months. Should we be expecting a Tainiao IPO to take place this year? Well, I guess given the um, very subdued um, indications from management um, overnight, I do think that you know it is a function of market conditions right now. If we continue to actually see valuations at the current depressed valuations, um, I don't think that this is an IPO that will come through um, before May of this year, which is the indicative timeline um, that was earlier communicated. Um, it may still be on the cards um, for the second half if the market um, and sentiments towards China turn for her better. That was our Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Asia Pacific Consumer Analyst Catherine Lim there. And uh, turning to another stock we've been watching here because Disney shares are up in extended trading. That's after the company's earnings beat estimates and it gave an upbeat profit outlook for the year. For more, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Media Analyst Gita Rang Ranganathan joins us now. And Gita, yeah, stocks higher in after hours by about 6%. What's standing out to you from the numbers? Yeah, I think overall this was really a blockbuster report for Disney and there are so many different things that I think investors are cheering. So we're seeing some great progress on the cost cutting efforts. The, the, the company guided to 20% EPS growth in fiscal 2024, which is way above what consensus was expecting. And then just across the board, we're seeing not just uh, you know, very good execution uh, in terms of, again, cost cutting, but also a very clear strategy for them going forward. And one of the key questions for investors and kind of going into this quarter was, what is their end game with ESPN? Is there a strategy for streaming? And they came out, uh, you know, uh, all guns blazing. So they have uh, a, a new bundled sports service where ESPN is going to be part of another bigger bundle. Uh, and then they have a standalone ESPN streaming service, which is going to be introduced in 2025. Uh, so, you know, everything seems to be going right for Disney right now. What does the, uh, the new sports streaming service mean potentially when it comes to ESPN's future? Did you ask what its name is? Uh, what are the implications for the future okay. of ESPN? Yeah. Yes, I think, you know, it's it, it was definitely a necessary step, I believe, for Disney because, you know, they're kind of seeing the writing on the wall here in terms of cord cutting. Um, what it means, I think, for the future is that they are going to be ready when more and more people cut the cord. We already have about 30 million people who have cut the cord in the United States. We're going to have tens of millions more who kind of do the same over the next few years. So this really kind of pos positions them to take control uh, of their future and kind of control the distribution, which is really important because up until now, you know, all of these big media companies have only controlled production, not distribution. So this really puts them uh, at the forefront of that. Something else that came out of the earnings was around uh, Disney's plans for Epic Games. And we heard it, uh, Bob Iger actually speaking about this. Let's just take a listen to what he said. Our new relationship with Epic Games will create a transformational games and entertainment universe that integrates Disney's world-class storytelling into Epic's cultural phenomenon, Fortnite, enabling consumers to play, watch, create, and shop for both digital and physical goods. How is that sort of investment that they're making likely to be viewed by, by investors, do you think, Ida? I think it's definitely a good investment. It's a step in the right direction. I mean, if there's one thing, this is not the first foray for Disney into the video games. I mean, they've had some fairly checkered history here, uh, more, I would say, failures than successes with, with direct involvement in video games, which is why they've kind of, uh, you know, always kind of stayed away from that direct investment and kind of gone to licensing. I think what they're realizing is they have this huge untapped market because if you just kind of look at the visitors to the theme parks, they're all these young children and they are, you know, they are the perfect target audience who are spending so much of time on video games and it you know kind of makes perfect sense it's 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 a great move for them to kind of now uh, invest make us make a fairly small investment but there's potentially a lot of upside and they can create a whole new entertainment universe which is which is really important for them going forward Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Media Analyst Gita Ranganathan there with the latest on Disney. We're still ahead, the US and Israel giving conflicting interpretations of the Hamas response to a hostage deal in Gaza. We get the latest on hopes for that ceasefire coming up.
Well, before that, we get Twin Focus's take on the recent Fed comments, suggesting that the Fed doesn't actually see an urgent case for lowering interest rates. The question is whether it matters to this market. This is Bloomberg. I'm very supportive of uh, being patient, you know, to get to where we need to get. I, I see at this point the trade-off, uh, which is, you know, coming into better balance is still being um, in favor of continuing to work on inflation. At some point, the continued cooling of inflation and labor markets may make it appropriate to reduce the target range for the federal funds rate. On the other hand, if progress on this inflation for some reason stalls, it may be appropriate to hold the target range steady at its current level for longer to ensure continued progress on our dual mandate. Fed officials Adriana Kugler and Thomas Barkin there on the Fed's rate outlook. Our next guest says Fed comments don't matter when the market has already discounted cuts. Joining us now is David Dalio, CEO at Twin Focus. And David, it, it is interesting how we operate within this environment where Fed speak is more important than ever, and yet the market continues to sort of outrun and outpace those expectations. Pleasure to see both of you, Heidi and uh, Annabelle. Um, the 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 Fed's comments matter less and less. We we've already discounted five or rate five or six rate cuts. Uh, the market will get there, um, or the Fed will get there. It's just a jawboning until until we're there. We have already discounted those cuts in the market. The rate curve already has that in the market, and we had a strong Treasury auction where people were anticipating it. Um, I, I think what matters is the real data and the hard data as it comes through. David, you know, if you sort of try and draw the similarities perhaps between how investors feel about the US market right now and how investors feel about China, it's sort of, uh, minds are pretty set, right? That they see what they see regardless of what policymakers necessarily are signaling and doing. But what I want to know is, how do you see the Chinese economy right now as being like a Taylor Swift concert? Boy, um, you know when you're you're at the Taylor Swift concert and you, you press the Uber button and you just don't know when it's going to come, but you know it will come, and 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 so that chaos that exists in the the Chinese market it is expected. And I thought uh, the inside intelligence from Bloomberg was excellent. From Stephen, look, it's a chaotic market. The economy's slowing. We've we've got a problem inside of real estate. The market knows that. But there are real companies underneath that. And, and Catherine mentioned Alibaba. Alibaba trades at about four times cash flow X the assets. And the company has a high ROA and it's still growing. So, so that Uber or that car will come. I think calling the day, week, and month that that market bottoms, though, is impossible. Um, what is different, so though, in the United States? Go ahead. No, no, continue. <laughs> yeah, I, what I was going to say that's different in the United States is that um, bad news is skipped and good news is just that, good news. Um, I'm very surprised that the U.S. public markets has not been more concerned by the news out of New York Community Bank Corp, specifically hi highlighting one of the largest assets in the world, which is apartments and multifamilies, that's gone in reverse. And, and I'm, I'm shocked that it has not been more concerning for the market as a whole. Um, and, and I can only imagine that people believe with the rate cuts will power through it. It's interesting you talk about um, NCBC because we, we, we have, of course, been watching that very closely. But at the same time, you're seeing some pressures when it comes to uh, the Japanese lender Azor as well as a result of their exposures. Do you think there is a broader theme perhaps developing as a risk for 2024 of these portfolio pressures and risks? Yeah, I, I, I believe we, we lowered real rates for, you know, give or take 15, 20 years. And we're just starting to lift them up. So to me, this is the second canary in the coal mine of what happens as you raise real rates. And, and the first one was the implosion of SPACs and IPO money in the U.S. public markets. The next one is we, we cut off long duration assets in, in apartments. And I think there'll be more. I think there will be more, um, regardless of what the Fed does.
Yeah, I'm interested how that plays into longer duration assets because you're highlighting private equity, venture capital here. We've seen these players really staying on the sidelines, at least in the M&A space. Is this going to also cause a crunch, do you think? You know, at Twin Focus, we, we meet with hundreds, if not thousands, of private capital credit managers a year. And, and, and we hear the same thing over and over again, um, which is we're slow to put capital to work. Um, we're also slow to give capital back. And as a result of that, there's a logjam. And that logjam is, you know, people don't have money to refresh. And, and, I, and I think that is just a slow motion credit crisis, very different than the credit crisis that's ongoing uh, in Asia that we highlighted earlier in the show. I guess then maybe it calls for some out-of-the-box thinking. And one of the, the views you've highlighted here is a preference for Greek equities, which isn't an, a market that we talk about too much on this show, at least. Why is that? I, I don't know that I've ever uh, invested in the Greek market. If it has been, it's been a long time. We, we've been warming up to emerging markets. Um, it is an area that has lagged. Uh, Greece in particular... Um, it was hard for me to believe, but they've cleared up their fiscal problems. They're actually running the largest fiscal surplus in Europe at this point. Um, the earnings estimates for the securities are going up and to the right, about double-digit earnings growth. Uh, the stocks trade for about six times earnings. Um, you know, really, it looks up and to the right, and there's still a lot of skepticism. All right, something to be tracking closer. That was David Daglio, CIO at Twin Focus there. And you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers go to Davy Go. It's also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize your settings so you only get news on the industries and the assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia. Here are some of the top bank stories that we're tracking this morning. And Bloomberg has learned that Citadel was among the hedge funds that received Morgan Stanley's trade leaks for favoured clients. Other recipients are said to include people at CAS Capital, Sigante Capital and Evolution Capital. Prosecutors haven't accused any alleged buy side participants of wrongdoing. Morgan Stanley paid $249 million to settle the investigation. Sources say New York Community Bank Corp has been reaching out to investors for capital to finance a large portfolio of residential mortgages. The bank is said to be considering a synthetic risk transfer backed by a portfolio of about $5 billion of home loans. NYCB is under pressure over its worsening credit quality. Ripples from the, US, from the troubles in the U.S. commercial market have now spread to Europe, with bonds at Deutsche PBB slumping over the bank's property exposure. Let's take a look at how we're shaping up this Thursday. We're just about uh, half an hour into the start of cash trading here in Sydney, just extending some of those uh, modest gains. We are poised more broadly across the region for uh, a pretty positive session there with uh, that edging higher in the early part of trading. Futures pointing to Japanese equities rising as well. Hong Kong shares potentially headed a little bit lower. Uh, and, of course, we are getting into the start of the holidays in China as well. Personnel change at uh, the CSRC could boost sentiment. The Carlyle Group is warning that market expectations for five or more Fed rate cuts are excessive. CEO Harvey Schwartz also told us exclusively that the company moved away from the troubled commercial real estate sector some time ago. One of the very fortunate things that I inherited when I showed up at Carlyle is one of the best real estate investing teams in the world. Um, their performance over 20 years is truly extraordinary. Um, when I talked to them about commercial real estate, they really started backing away from office many, many years ago. We don't see it as a sector where yet we, we see real opportunity. So I think there's going to be challenges. But I think this plays out 
over many, many years, because in some respects, we can see this problem. Um, but it's a problem that will have to be digested by the markets over a number of years. Yeah, let's get a little macro here, because part of this problem is being caused on the heels of higher interest rates. And you have a market now that still expects more than five rate cuts before the January FOMC meeting of next year. Do you believe that those five rate cuts will come to fruition? So we have a pretty unique perspective on this because across our portfolio companies, we have in excess of a million employees and we see the data and the performance. I would say that if you step back and you think about historic Fed behavior, the Fed typically either is fine tuning or cutting dramatically or raising dramatically. And when we look at the data from our portfolio companies and then you look at strong GDP, unemployment numbers that are quite attractive, when you see inflation has really stopped materially and paused at this stage, I don't think we should be rooting for five or eight rate cuts. I think that would suggest an environment that actually requires a lot of attention from the Fed. I think we should be hoping for fine tuning because I think the economy is in better shape than people are giving credit for. And I think the Fed's done a fantastic job navigating this. So what is a more realistic view of where rates go? In our model, we would expect the base case to be two or three cuts. The Fed, we expect to be very data sensitive. We're watching this closely also. But again, my crystal ball uh, may be as good as yours. So we'll see what happens. Well, Markets are hard to predict. What's the risk then that we tip over from a soft landing or even no landing into a recession? What would cause the tides to turn? I think you could see if you had an unexpected market disruption, geopolitical event. Um, but remember, the Fed has communicated to us that they're watching this data very carefully. And so hoping for multiple rate cuts I think it's a little bit of a recency bias. I think it's people really saying, oh, I really enjoyed that QE that we're experiencing. I think as market participants, we should want a normalized cost of capital. And if we can get there through this process, I think it'd be an extraordinary outcome. And I, and I think it'd actually be, I think it'd be great for business opportunities. I think it'd be really good for Carlisle. And I think it'd be great for our investing clients. I think we'd create a lot of alpha. That was the Carlisle CEO, Harvey Schwartz, speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. And let's uh, shift focus now to this part of the world and Chinese equities uh, on that countdown to the Lunar New Year break, taking a look here at futures. And you can see a little bit of stability perhaps we're finding here. You've got some regulatory changes coming through. We were talking about the personnel change at the CSRC overnight. So that uh, raises hopes perhaps that new measures are in the pipeline. But still, uh, the, the value these are looking extremely cheap and that, that pessimism does continue to persist. So let's bring in our guest now. This is Eddie Chung, Senior Emerging Market Strategist at Credit Agricole CIB, uh, here this morning in the Hong Kong studio with us. So, Eddie, where do you think we're at in the sell-off now? Do you think we're, we've hit the bottom at this point in time? I think it's still early to say we're out of the woods right now. I mean, what we're seeing is, yes, there are taking more, much more positive steps towards change. It does look like policy easing is on the way. We do expect more policy easing on the way. Uh, as you mentioned as well, the valuations are very attractive. But while we're at one day heading into the Lunar New Year, we're about to go into a break. I think it's probably still more time is needed for there to be more concrete policy action. The problem right now is if we look at market expectations versus what's really coming out, there's still a bit of a gap there. So markets are, when they see the news, they jump a little bit, and then one to two days after, it kind of goes back. Mm. So it shows you that markets are still expecting a bit more. But then I think another tangible question is, well, do the authorities really have to do that much more to meet the market expectation? There are two aspects of that. Uh, the, in, our, in our view, the economy is recovering. It's a bit of a bumpy road. I think the big issue is when they really get out of this deflation problem. So we had the CPI numbers today, still expected to see deflation. But as we gradually improve, I would say closer to Q2, then maybe they don't have to do as much. I want to bring your attention to this chart here because this is looking at the the performance of the, the benchmark in China, the CSI 300, after we've seen leadership changes that the securities regulated in the past. And you can see here that there has been that move higher. Uh, overnight, we had the news that, that we had a replacement coming through. How do you think the market is likely to interpret that today? 
I think the timing is certainly very interesting as right ahead of the Lunar New Year, given everything that has been happening, they replace the securities regulator. I think the general expectation, they see this as a bit more positive. Mm. Uh, markets are inclined to be a bit more hopeful into the year of the dragon and I think that is just another aspect of all the broader changes that are coming through. But I think the reality is we really don't know yet. The, the issue is we have to wait and see until after Lunar New Year, are there going to be more things happening? What is the real tangible change happening? I think there are suggestions that uh, things are happening behind the scenes, but in terms of is this the turnaround, I think it's still too early. Does there need to be more market reforms? I mean, I know most of the focus have been on stimulus measures, on fiscal measures, but does there need to be more capital markets reforms, you think, to be able to stoke confidence? Because, you know, on the macro front, we're getting inflation numbers later on today. We're not expecting a market improvement, just sort of further, you know, muddling through that deflationary spiral. Yeah, absolutely. Well, basically, I think we expect ref reform or easing or macro support across a whole host of measures, whether it's monetary easing, fiscal easing, property measures, market reform. These are all things which markets are desperately calling for right now at this point in time. Uh, so our view from the monetary side, we expect more RR cuts, maybe at least another 50 basis points. Um, fiscal fiscal support from the central government, that's also, like, that's also very much needed. Property support to rebuild confidence. I think we've seen a lot more of those already, uh, but it's just really when it catches on and really kind of ignites the market. So we're not saying that, I think the biggest issue right now is confidence and it's how they bring that about. But confidence can also be a very fickle thing. So it's, it's not like, oh, well, you do A, B, C and D and therefore confidence comes back. It's really how they manage to massage these animal spirits and bring things back. Well correlated or anchored is the fate of China to the rest of the emerging market complex now, would you say? Because I think throughout the course of last year, there were points where we thought, well, that correlation actually seems to be getting weaker. Is it still going to be one of the major themes for EMs? Absolutely. I think, well, as you, as you really noted, I think what we have seen so far is there has been a bit of a decorrelation of China markets. But I think China still has a very important role to play, especially within the Asia context, and whether it's talking about trade, whether it does lift sentiment. So right now, in our view for Asia, is there's a bit of a triple threat. The first threat is coming from the Fed, that Fed rate uncertainty. Second, it's about sentiment, so where is China going? That so far hasn't been that. Great thirdly is the geopolitics. So I think if we get this China rebound, or we get at least sentiment stabilizing a bit, I think this can be also one of the aspects why why we're more optimistic towards Asia uh, over the course of this year. What else is going to perhaps drive optimism around Asia, particularly for the key markets, Taiwan and Korea, is where we're at in the chip cycle. So we've sort of seen some mixed signals coming through. Where do you think we're at right now in the recovery? Well, what we have been consistently saying is, yes, we think the chip cycle is coming, but we think it's going to be slower than expected. But I think what has been interesting is markets have we can't say complacent, our markets have kind of gotten ahead of itself. If you look at the performance of the SOX index, uh, basically the rally is huge, right? Well, partially it's also driven by the AI factor. But fundamentally, looking at some of the data, looking at TSMC revenues, looking at Taiwan exports, looking at Korea exports, it is very clear that there's a bit of a segregation going on in the chip cycle. The top end of the value chain is recovering a lot faster. The lower end, I think, is still a bit muddled through at this point in time. So we need to a bit, be a bit more cautious. I think what that speaks to, though, is for currencies like the Korean won, mm. for the Taiwan dollar, these can perform a bit better. We have been seeing the foreign investor inflows coming through. And I think that will be more supportive of their performances in the, in the coming months. Eddie Chung, Senior Emerging Market Strategist at Credit Agricole CIB, there with us in Hong Kong. Well, arm holding shares certainly soared in extended trading after the chip designer gave a surprisingly bullish forecast, suggesting its push beyond smartphones is helping fuel growth and profitability. Its majority owner, SoftBank, is also on track to post one of its strongest quarters in years when it reports earnings later on Thursday. For more, let's bring up Bloomberg Technology reporter Min Jong Lee in Tokyo. So, Min Jong, first of all, what did we hear from arm? Yes, uh, like you just said, it's, uh, it's given a surprisingly bullish forecast 
for the March quarter and has bolstered um, arms shares in after hours trading. And while arms share price increase itself doesn't directly impact soft bank earnings, uh, it does provide a big push for the total value of SoftBank's assets, one of the key metrics uh, for, for SoftBank. And we do kind of expect a pop uh, for SoftBank shares uh, when it starts trading today, too. And also, SoftBank itself is forecast to have a, a pretty positive quarter itself for the December quarter because of the rise in the value of Vision Fund assets and some extra gain from T-Mobile shares. So quite a bit of positive news for SoftBank today. Where there is perhaps some skepticism, Minjong, is more around the second of its vision fund that's still got mm -hmm. a lot of issues or losses perhaps mm -hmm. in its privately held startups. So what are we expecting to hear mm -hmm. from those ones or that portfolio of companies? You're right. Uh, we still don't have clarity over how the Vision Fund's uh, privately held assets have been marked during the December quarter. So we, we can only speculate uh, that the value would be possibly a status quo or um, but but there are critics who think that there is potential for these privately held assets to be marked down uh, uh, going forward which will have a negative impact on vision fund earnings and therefore softbanks earnings too so there will definitely be a lot of interest around what uh, what goto the CFO has to say about these assets um, and see if there is any uh, possibility that these private assets will, uh, will, will, will rebound as well. But we'll have to see. Um. And what else are you going to be tracking out of this? I think perhaps what they say about AI, for instance, is, is that going to be another key theme? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, uh, definitely, especially with arm shares uh, soaring like this. And uh, given such a positive forecast, I think there will be a lot of interest around how SoftBank plays uh, plans on playing up its push into AI technology and all the startup investments. And, of course, any extra plans SoftBank has with ARM with regards to more AI-related projects or businesses or any new investments uh, SoftBank possibly plans into the area of AI, which now sounds so promising, uh, there will definitely be a lot of interest around, around those plans and ideas. All right, a big earnings release we're going to be tracking later. That was our Bloomberg Technology reporter, Min Jong Lee, there. Still ahead, the U.S. and Israel give conflicting interpretations of the Hamas response to a hostage deal in Gaza. We'll have the latest on the Middle East crisis next. This is Bloomberg. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. And we will work at that relentlessly until we get there. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken there on Hamas's response to a proposal to pause the Gaza conflict and release dozens of hostages. But Israel seems to have rejected the terms from the militant group. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will continue to press on with its fight. Michael Heath is here with more. And, you know, within that space that Secretary Blinken talks about, seems to be a lot of room for interpretation on all sides. Yeah, it's, a, it's really curious, Heidi, isn't it? Because you read Netanyahu's remarks and they're like, this is no deal. Well, this is a non-starter, uh, and obviously Blinken is like, you know, this this is an opening gambit. And the Israeli media says that um, that their sources in government say that it was a high opening proposal. So it does seem like that there is movement there. And the question really comes down to what's Israel prepared to pay for these hostages? Um, and, you know, there is significant groundswell within Israel society that they have to get these people out. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that, that uh, 51 are dead. Mm. Um, 
So we're down to 85. So it's getting very, very difficult for them. Um, obviously, there's the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, etc. But from Israel's side, it's just what are they prepared to pay here? And, um, and Hamas is obviously, they realise that, that the hostages are central here. So that's what it sort of comes down to. So it does seem like something is happening, something is moving, that the public remarks, um, to some extent, are a little bit of, bit of show, but it's going to take time, definitely. And Michael, this has been happening concurrently. The, the US has been also carrying out airstrikes in Iraq as retaliation to, to the servicemen that were killed. Yeah, that's right, Annabelle. And so, I mean, the, 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 it's a, the, the, the discussion over a ceasefire really it, it will have broad ramifications. I mean, the US, what it's doing is sort of separate. It, it's trying to, to, to show these, um, these Iranian-backed groups that, uh, that there is a price to pay. Now, in, in a sense, it delayed uh, taking, a lot of, taking any action in response to the death of those US servicemen. It's almost like they wanted the Iranians, any Iranians who were there to be um, gotten out of the way so that... that uh, as Iran tries to do too, the US and Iran can separate state to state issues and, and it would just be between these proxies. But the US is going to keep targeting them clearly. But uh, even, you know, if you get a, if you get a ceasefire or, or some sort of truce in the Gaza Strip, the, that could have reverberations across the whole region. Uh, it, it may be that these, these sort of attacks uh, on US forces start to stop. The US doesn't need to reply. Um, you know, the, with the Houthis and the, and the firing on ships, potentially that comes to an end as well. So there's a lot at stake. But as I was saying to Heidi earlier, it really just comes down to what will Israel pay for these hostages? And, and it sounds terrible to say, but, uh, you know, the, the idea that you can get rid of Hamas or, or that you can remove them and, and release these hostages, it's, it's not really a starter. So the question is, can Israel accept that, that Hamas will, will remain with some role in the Gaza Strip? How is that going to work? There's a lot at stake here. How much... Uh, what is the domestic support situation looking like within Israel? Well, I mean, the, the, the polls show that um, if an election was held now that, that Netanyahu would lose. Um, but that, that said, and, and in a sense, uh, you know, for his own political survival, uh, while this war goes on, while this conflict goes on, there's not going to be any change uh, it, in the political uh, position of, of the Prime Minister. But he, 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 I mean, he's a very canny operator, but he needs to gauge what, what, will, what will society tolerate. Obviously, there's a big groundswell of people who want these hostages released. Israel is very, very serious. Historically, it has been. It wants, it wants even its dead soldiers. It, it wants all of the bones of everybody so when it comes to hostages it wants those people brought out but um, whether whether you can square that with a very very strong right wing that's you can't negotiate with Hamas that you know maybe these people have to be sacrificed in order to, to for the greater good to defeat this uh, this what they term an evil um, these these are questions that are just going to have to be resolved politically by Israel Folks, Michael Heath here with the latest. Taking a look at some of the other geopolitical headlines that we're following this hour, the UN Senate has killed a bipartisan bill on the border uh, and Ukraine, with Republicans rejecting the measure as it was unveiled. Former President Donald Trump had criticised the legislation and House Speaker Mike Johnson said that it would be dead on arrival in that chamber. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer now plans a separate vote on aid for Ukraine and Israel without US border provisions. The Biden administration is planning a new effort to prevent foreign adversaries from accessing American sensitive personal data. Sources say the president may sign an order as soon as next week. We're told the plan focuses on preventing China, in particular, from being able to access data, including information on individuals' finances, genetic makeup and voice patterns. Pakistan will close its borders with Afghanistan and Iran on Thursday as voters head to the polls. The decision comes after two bomb blasts tar targeting political headquarters in the northwest killed at least 20 people in the day before national elections. Former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is expected to return to office with his biggest rival, Imran Khan, in prison and disqualified from running. Heidi, just uh, bringing your attention or our attention to some breaking heads that are crossing the terminal now. This is trade data from Japan uh, for the month of December here. So we saw the current account in surplus for the period of December uh, coming in at 744 billion yen. That was far higher or lower rather than what had been estimated of 1.13 trillion yen, but still a reflection that surplus perhaps of, of the amount of domestic 
tourism or inbound tourism that we have been seeing in Japan, uh, travel numbers recovering to, to their pre-pandemic levels or thereabouts. The trade deficit also in surplus for the period of 115 billion yen. Uh, so something as well that can help uh, sort of ease those, those concerns around the currency, uh, given we had seen a dwindling balance of payments, particularly uh, when we had oil at more elevated levels, uh, something that could have weakened purchasing power, but uh, still something that could be offering some degree of relief to policymakers. But we'll have more ahead as we count down to the open in Tokyo. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Australia, some of the corporate headlines that we're tracking. The head of Bank Dance's China operation is stepping down a week after the company said it needed to make up lost ground in AI. Kelly Jung is leaving as a head of Douyin, which is a Chinese version of TikTok. Bloomberg has learned that Bank Dance will not seek to appoint a successor. In a company wide meeting last month, CEO Liang Rubo said Bank Dance needed more urgency to catch up in the AI space. Tesla shares jumped after Bloomberg revealed that managers had been asked to identify which positions were critical, a possible precursor to layoffs. Us also say it's also cancelled performance reviews for some employees. Tesla has roughly doubled its workforce since 2020 to around 140,000 people. Uber has reported quarterly gross bookings of $37.6 billion, beating analyst estimates on strong global demand during the holiday period. Gross bookings include delivery orders, ride hails and driver and merchant earnings. For the current period, Uber sees bookings of up to $38.5 billion, with a midpoint slightly above Wall Street's average estimate. And in Asia, we're very, very excited about the India market. Um, the India market has been one that... that uh, has has always held a lot of promise, but we're seeing that promise come to fruition now. There, it's not just four-wheelers, but it's three-wheelers, and the growth rates uh, that we're seeing in India are substantial, and we think that, you know, that business can continue to grow over the next five to ten years. And these are the stocks we're going to be watching when trade in opens in Korea and Japan shortly. Asian chip stocks, you can see here, they could climb after TSMC posted a rise in monthly sales on the back of strong demand for AI chips. TSMC's ADRs jumped 4.7% in New York. A plus, keep an eye on payment stocks such as Japan's GMO payment gateway as PayPal forecasts flat earnings this year.